God bless you. Good morning, everyone. We're so glad that you came to worship Jesus with us this morning. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn with me to the book of Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, and I want to talk with you for a few minutes this morning about the God who gave himself. Philippians chapter 2. While you find your way there, a couple of quick reminders. We will be here on Christmas Eve at 4.30 p.m. and 6 p.m. Beautiful candlelight uh, service, and we hope that you'll be able to join us. There's a postcard in your bulletin, and uh, that's not really for you. It has the service times and, and where to find us. That's not really for you. That's for you to give to somebody. And uh, I want you to pray over that postcard. Put your hand on it, pray over it, and then I want you to put it in someone else's hands, a neighbor, a coworker, a friend, a family member, and invite them to come to church with you on Christmas Eve. We're going to be sharing the good news about Jesus. And uh, so just have someone come with you. You'll be amazed. The grace of God attached itself to a handkerchief, and it caused a healing in another city. The grace of God can attach itself to that postcard when you pray over it, and someone will say yes and come to church with you on Christmas Eve. And then we'll be here on New Year's Eve as well at 6 p.m. We'll have a worship service. We're going to have communion. And then after the service officially dismisses, all of our prayer teams and our pastors are going to be here to minister to you. And if you'd like to receive a word of prayer, a blessing, and we're trusting the gifts of the Holy Spirit to be in operation, uh, to just encourage and give words of guidance for the coming year, we'd love to see you. And then I want to thank you for all of your giving. Wasn't that awesome, that church in Bangladesh that uh, came together because you gave? You know, before we ever had this building, we built churches all over the world. We've built several churches since we've been in this building. And now we're building our own building. And uh, we want to thank you for all your giving that has gotten us this far. And we want to ask you to make the best gift that you can before the end of the year towards our new phase two building. We're uh, rolling along now. As soon as the new year is over, we're going to lose the main front entrance. You're going to be coming in and out of the sanctuary through these doors right here. Uh, lots of changes. But uh, if you want to receive tax credit for giving in the year 2014, you just have one week left. And we need to receive your gifts postmarked by December 31st in our office. And I'm praying that the Lord will send three wise men to open their treasures and lavish them on the body of Christ. I'm praying that the Lord will send a woman with an alabaster box to just lavish her treasure to help us keep moving forward with phase two. All right, look with me in Philippians chapter two. And let's talk this morning about the God who gave himself. Philippians chapter two and reading in verse five. Paul says, let this mindset be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped at. But he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and has given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let's pray this morning, and as we pray, uh, I want you to pray with me, especially for the city of New York. Let's pray for peace on New York. Let's pray for the families of the officers who gave their lives in the line of duty yesterday. Let's pray for all the men and women in law enforcement. And let's pray for every aggrieved person in the city. They need the Prince of Peace. We need the Prince of Peace. So let's pray together. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your presence here. Father, I thank you that 2,000 years ago, one night in Bethlehem, heaven invaded earth. And I pray, Father, that heaven would invade earth this morning in this place. Father, we pray together for the city of New York. We pray for the peace, the Prince of Peace, Lord, to come and spread his arms over New York City. We pray, Lord, for the families of the officers who gave their lives in the line of duty. God, we pray for your help for them. Lord, we pray for your peace over every aggrieved person in New York City. You are the Prince of Peace. You are the one who takes down the dividing wall of hostility. So, Father, I pray that even this week as Christmas comes, Lord, you'd bring healing to New York and to our nation. 
Father, we thank you for talking to us now from your scriptures. In Jesus' name, if your heart agrees with that, just say amen and amen. Well, I have to tell you the truth. I have already celebrated Christmas this year. I'm looking forward to our beautiful Christmas Eve services here. I'm looking forward to Christmas Day with my family, seeing the delight in my children's faces, my in-laws being with us. But I want you to know that I have already had my own personal Christmas party in my heart. Several years ago, I was complaining to the Lord that I had absolutely no inspiration for a Christmas sermon. Everything I wrote just sounded so cliche to me. And the Lord spoke to me rather quickly. And he said, Glenn, the reason that you're not inspired is because you have never really reflected on the meaning of the incarnation. Kaboom. I had to tell you the truth. When the Holy Spirit said that to me, it rocked my world. And when I began to study and I began to reflect on the incarnation, it rocked my world, and it has rocked my world every Christmas since. This week I was reflecting again on the Incarnation, and I want to tell you Wednesday night and Thursday morning, I had an epiphany in my heart that just made it overflow all over again with joy and gratitude and awe and wonder at the person of Jesus. Christmas filled my heart. And my prayer for you this morning is that the meaning of the incarnation would rock your world too. My prayer is the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit would fill your heart with joy and gratitude and awe at the person of Jesus. And this is the truth that caused the celebration in my heart. The incarnation is the ultimate revelation of the Father to us. The incarnation gives us the clearest picture that we have of God's nature. It gives us the best glimpse that we have of God's heart. Maybe we could put it this way. Jesus is God's selfie. He shows us what God looks like, not on the outside, but on the inside. John said the word became flesh. And pitched his tent among us, dwelt among us. No man has ever seen God. But God, the one and only who was at the Father's side, has come and has made him known to us. Hebrew says in the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets. But now he has spoken to us through his Son. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Paul said he is the image of the unseen God. All the fullness of God dwelt in his body. Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. So what is it that Jesus in his incarnation has made known to us about the Father? What qualities of the Father radiate to us through the life of the Son? What character qualities of the Father does Jesus precisely represent to us? What does he portray to us about the nature of the Father? As I was reflecting on the incarnation this week, the Holy Spirit just made three things jump out at me. And I want to share them with you quickly this morning. I have to tell you what, you're going to have to work for it just a little bit. I'm going to preach as good as I can. You've got to listen as good as you can. Now, that's bad grammar, but it's a good exhortation. <laughs> what does the incarnation show me about the Father? First of all, the incarnation shows me that God's nature is essentially relational. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. They shall call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. It's impossible to understand the Christmas story without going all the way back to the beginning. John says, before the beginning began, God has always existed in a relationship of perfect intimacy and harmony and honor and delight. You see, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit have always coexisted together, co-equally and co-eternally, three distinct divine persons in a way that exceeds our ability to grasp who comprise one divine Godhead. 
John said they exist face to face with one another. Actually, it's a very provocative expression. The picture is of a husband and wife who are face to face with one another and moving closer and closer for intimacy. God is a spirit, so John didn't mean that literally, but it's a metaphor for the intense, ever-increasing intimacy that exists between the three persons of the Trinity. God's eternal nature is relational. He is a divine relationship at the center of the universe. And then God created the heavens and the earth, light and darkness, Day and night, sky and sea and land, plants and animals and birds and every creature of the sea. And God said it was all good. And then God made man from the dust of the earth and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. But man was not the pinnacle of God's creation. For God saw that man was all alone and he said that's not good God saw that the male lion had a female lion with corresponding body parts that connected and God said that's good he saw that the male bear had a female bear with body parts that connected them and God said that's good but God saw that the man had no one with corresponding body parts that's literally what the Hebrew says in Genesis chapter 2 and God said that's not good. So he took a rib from the man and he made Eve and he brought her to the man and the man said, Woo, man, that's good. <laughs> and God said, let these two, listen, let these two become permanently joined together in a bond of exclusive relationship called one flesh. Let these two be joined together in a covenant relationship of mutual affection and honor and submission and care and delight. And what if that is the pinnacle of God's creation? Not man alone, but a man and a woman united in a mysterious spiritual bond of intimate relationship that creates on earth a picture of the heavenly reality of the Trinity. What if that is the sense in which we have all been created in the image of God, not merely that our individual being consists of three components, but that we were created to experience the delight of a loving covenant relationship just as God eternally exists in the delight of a perfect divine relationship. That's good preaching right there. God is relational by nature. And he has created us relational too in his image. The Trinity is one of those divine mysteries that is too wonderful for us. We struggle to find pictures that help us to comprehend it. We talk about an egg, right? It has a, a yolk, it has a white, it has a shell. We talk about water, it's, it's solid ice, it's liquid, it's a gas. But those don't really cut it. You know, we don't have to look any further because God himself has already given us a much better earthly picture of his triune nature, and that's marriage and the family. The one flesh bond helps us to understand God himself. For the last few weeks, we've been in 1 Corinthians, and we've been talking about the importance of fidelity to the one flesh bond of marriage. And here's why it's so important, because the family is the first vehicle that God created to portray himself to us. The one flesh bond of marriage gives us a glimpse at the inner workings of the Godhead himself. Just like a marriage, the Trinity is a holy relationship in which there is a deep commitment and affection and honor and equality and mutual submission and delight. The one flesh bond of marriage also helps us to understand God's motivation for creating us. You see, God is so big that he overflows. The love within the Godhead is so plentiful that it overflows. The life within him is so abundant that it overflows. It's just like the godly desire of a husband and a wife to create children. Their love for one another is so good that they want to multiply it. 
Their love for one another is so deep that they want to produce something together that's a testament of their love. Their love for one another is so abundant that they want to share the joy of it by adding more people into their circle. They want to perpetuate their love that way. And that is precisely why God created us. Beloved, listen to me. God did not create us because he was needy. He didn't create us because he wanted someone to boss around or because he wanted someone to grovel at his feet. He didn't create us because he was lonely either. God was already perfectly complete in himself. He was all the company that he ever needed. But God created us because what he had going on inside was just too good not to share. His love was so good it had to be multiplied to others. His love was so good it had to produce something. The joy of it had to be shared. The one flesh bond of marriage also helps us to understand the relationship that God earnestly wants to share with each one of us. Paul said marriage is an earthly picture of the spiritual bond that we were meant to share with God. You see, in the beginning, in the garden, the man and the woman, they were bound in a relationship to one another by the Holy Spirit. And they were bound in a relationship to God by the Holy Spirit. But along came the serpent, sowing seeds of doubt. His very name means slanderer. And that's precisely what he did. He slandered God. He made them doubt God's love for them. He made them doubt God's trustworthiness. He made them doubt God's motives. Their disobedience was the fruit of devilish disbelief. And when they sinned, the Holy Spirit was taken away from them. And they lost their connection to God. And their connection to one another was severely injured. And that brings us to the incarnation. Why did God become a man? Without ceasing to be God in any regard, God the Son assumed a human nature into his divine nature and he assumed a body of human flesh into his divine being. And he stepped into human history and he dwelt among us. Why did God do that? Well, God became a man because his nature is essentially relational and he created us relational too. In fact, he specifically created us to have a love relationship with him. God became a man not because he needs us, but because he wants us. In John 17, Jesus prayed, Father, I want those whom you have given me to be with me where I am. He became God with us precisely because he wants to get with us. God became a man because he is not a celestial loner, but he is an incurable lover. He became a man because he refuses to ever give up on us. He became a man to pursue us. He is the faithful shepherd searching for his lost sheep. He is the diligent woman searching for her lost coin. He is the forgiving father who hiked up his robe and came running into our world with open arms to escort his wayward son back home again. God became a man to woo us. He became a man to wow us. He became a man to win us back, to wed us, and then to welcome us home into his presence. You see, the incarnation is God's invitation to come through Jesus Christ and to join into the loving relationship that exists in the center of the universe. Three things that the incarnation shows me about the Father. It shows me that he is relational. And the second thing, the incarnation shows me that God's nature is infinitely humble. If you've ever studied systematic theology, it always begins with the attributes of God. What is God like? God is a spirit. God is one. God is eternal. God is holy. God is love. God is immutable. That means he can't be changed. God is omnipotent. That means he's all-powerful. He's omniscient. He knows everything. He's omnipresent. That means he's everywhere at once. 
God is transcendent. He's bigger than me. He's above me. And he's imminent. He's God with me. But here is one attribute of God that you almost never see. God is humble. Now there's a paradoxical thought, if ever you've heard one. How can the infinite, eternal God, the creator of everything, the one who lives in unapproachable light, how can it be said of him that he is humble? And yet that's precisely what the incarnate son radiates to me about the father. That's precisely what he represents, what he portrays to us about the father. Remember, everything that Jesus is, the father is. And everything the father is, Jesus is. In Philippians chapter 2, Paul talks about the humility that God displayed in the incarnate son. Looking at his words, I find first of all that God's nature was humble before the incarnation. Paul says, although the Son was always in his very nature God, he didn't strive for equality with the Father. You see, that tells us something important about the relationship dynamic within the Godhead. It is a beautiful, beautiful atmosphere of mutual honor and submission. There is no power struggle in the Godhead. The Son is joyfully submitted to the Father. The Spirit is joyfully submitted to the Father and the Son. And the Father and the Son and the Spirit, they are madly in love with one another. That means that humility is in the very essence of God's being. Humility wasn't just a temporary phase for Jesus while he accomplished the task of our redemption here on earth. Jesus didn't get back to heaven, sit down on his throne and say, I'm glad that humility thing is all done with. Humble is what Jesus was. It's what he has always been. It's what he will always be. Before the incarnation, before the foundation of the world was laid, he was called the Lamb of God slain. But then the extent of God's humility was fully displayed in the incarnation of the Son. Paul said he made himself nothing. Taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in the likeness of a man. Have you ever really paused to reflect on what the incarnation shows us about the humble heart of our great God? It shows us that God valued his relationship with us above his own dignity. In spite of being scorned by his own creations, he extended himself to us again. In order to mend the love relationship that we broke, he took the hurt on himself. He took responsibility when he had absolutely no obligation to do so. He owned the guilt that wasn't his. He took the fall. He paid the price to get us back. Although he was fully God in nature, the son didn't cling to his rights and privileges. Instead, he emptied himself, not of his deity, but of every last shred of his dignity. Consider, if you will, the humility of God on full display in the utter humiliation of the incarnate son. Consider the humiliation of infancy. You know, Jesus could have just appeared on the scene in time for his beautiful earthly ministry. Could have just showed up out of nowhere like Melchizedek. But instead, we're made witnesses to all the humiliating details surrounding his arrival on earth as a vulnerable baby. Consider the humiliation of a suspiciously inexplicable pregnancy. A stain that would follow Jesus his entire life. Listen to me, if you're here this morning and there are some question marks about your paternity, I want you to take heart. You have a great high priest who is praying for you, who knows exactly what that feels like. <laughs> Consider the humiliation of being born into abject poverty. Mary and Joseph were unwelcome guests in an overcrowded home at a most inconvenient time. Away in a manger... No crib for a bed. And the visitors that came, shepherds, the poorest of all peasants. During his life, Jesus would endure homelessness. 
He would endure hunger. He would endure the burden of tax bills. Listen, if you have faced any of those things, if you're facing any of those things right now, take heart. You have a great high priest who is praying for you, who knows exactly what that feels like. Consider the humiliation of childhood and adolescence, submitting to the authority of his earthly parents, their discipline. I can only imagine how Jesus winced every time. You know, parents can be embarrassing. I can only imagine Jesus winced every time they brought up the incident. <laughs> hey, Jesus, remember the time we lost you in the temple? I thought you were with your mother. Your mother thought you were with me. Wasn't that funny? Ah, good times, that. <laughs> Consider the humiliation of hailing from the boonies. Nazareth was the Arkansas, the West Virginia, the Appalachia of Israel. We live in Greenwich. I can get away with that. <laughs> Nazareth was a hick town with absolutely nothing going for it. Can anything good come from Nazareth? The answer is no, it cannot. And yet it pleased the Father that the Son should forever bear the moniker Jesus of Nazareth. And still all around the world today, his followers proudly bear that title in the face of brutal persecution. Even in the face of martyrdom, they are proud to be called Nazarenes. Consider the humiliation of being born into a working class family. Consider the humiliation of manual labor. The humiliation of earning daily bread by the sweat of his brow, the blessed king of the universe who brings forth bread from the earth. Consider the humiliation of receiving only the most basic education. Consider the humil humiliation of being born under severe political oppression. There was a Roman garrison nearby Nazareth. No doubt when Jesus used illustrations in his sermons about Roman soldiers commandeering personal property or conscripting someone to carry their gear for a mile or two, Jesus was speaking from personal experience. No doubt he saw people verbally abused, physically roughed up. No doubt he knew of young girls who were assaulted by Roman soldiers. Consider the humiliation of subjection to bodily needs and weakness. When in all of eternity was God ever cold or hungry or thirsty or sleep deprived or weary or sore or sick? When did God ever shiver in the dark of night or swelter in the scorching heat of day? Jesus entered fully into our human experience. He fully participated in our human experience. Consider the humiliation of subjection to human emotions. When in eternity was God ever overcome with human disappointment or despair or grief or anxiety or even anger? Listen, I have to say this this morning to someone. If you're struggling right now this Christmas season to hold it together, if you feel like you're just going to lose it, I want you to take heart. You have a great high priest who is praying for you this morning who knows exactly how you feel. Consider the humiliation of his identification with sinners in the waters of baptism. When Jesus came to the Jordan, John said, no, Jesus, I need to be baptized by you. But Jesus said, John, we have to do this. Jesus had no sins to repent of, but he was water baptized to identify fully with our sinful humanity. That's why Hebrews says he became like his brothers in every way. And when the father saw that act of humility on the part of the son, he couldn't help himself. He broke through the fourth wall and he shouted down from heaven, That's my son. I love him. I'm proud of him. The Holy Spirit couldn't help himself. He had to be with Jesus. So he fluttered down from heaven in the form of a dove and rested on the son. You see, that's what humility does. It irresistibly attracts the Father because He Himself is humble and like calls unto like. God said through the prophet Isaiah, Heaven is my throne and earth is my ottoman. I made them all and they all belong to me. But He said, the man who catches my attention is the one who is humble and contrite in spirit. Peter said, God opposes the proud, 
but he gives more grace to the humble. When the father saw Jesus' humility and baptism, he couldn't help himself. Consider the humiliation of Jesus' temptation. The immutably holy God who cannot be tempted with evil had to endure the loathsome company of the father of lies. Consider the humiliation of living in total surrender to the will of the father. Jesus said, I only do and say what my father tells me to. He relinquished all of his rights. He relinquished all of his ambitions. He denied himself some joyful human experiences in obedience to his father. You know, amazingly, humility is the only character trait that Jesus ever explicitly identified about himself. Jesus was wise, but he never said, I am wise. Jesus was holy, but he never said, I am holy. But he did say, take my yoke and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart. And you will find rest for your souls. Consider the humiliation of Jesus' itinerant preaching ministry. A career for which he had no credentials and no formal training. A career which made him dependent on the hospitality and the offerings of strangers. A career which embarrassed his family. They came to fetch him at one point and said, Jesus, come on home, you're embarrassing us. Consider the humiliation of his service to the sick and the broken. Consider the humiliation of being associated with the losers and the unlucky in life. Swindlers and adulterers. Consider the humiliation of people's ingratitude after he gave of himself so selflessly they forgot to even come back and say thank you. Consider the humiliation of being used by gain, used for gain by your own friends. Consider the humiliation of washing their thankless feet. Consider the humiliation of being scrutinized and interrogated and weighed by your own creations, being misunderstood, underestimated, having your motives challenged. Consider the humiliation of his rejection, the false accusations, his betrayal, his arrest, being abandoned by his dearest friends. Consider the humiliation of his mock trial, of false witnesses, of the fickle crowd, the same ones who cheered, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord on Monday, shouted, crucify him on Thursday. Consider the humiliation of being turned over to unclean Gentile governors, the true king of the Jews, God's holy anointed one, the Messiah, was handed over to the Romans by his own people. And then the incarnate son endured the ultimate humiliation. Paul says, and being regarded by men as nothing more than a mere man, he humbled himself and he became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Consider the humiliation of the incarnate son on the cross. An execution so cruel that Roman citizens couldn't even be sentenced to it. It was reserved for slaves and the most vile of criminals. An execution so grotesque that it was uncouth to even mention crucifixion in polite conversation. Consider the humiliation of public nudity. Consider the humiliation of the unbear unbearable physical anguish. Consider the humiliation of the monstrous bloody spectacle. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. We hid our faces from him. Consider the humiliation of being executed alongside common criminals. Consider the humiliation of the jeering crowds and his weeping mother and his absent disciples. Beloved, listen to me. Here's the thing about Jesus' humiliation on the cross. Jesus didn't come to earth as anything less than God. Jesus on earth was not God with his arms tied behind his back. The thing about Jesus' humiliation is that everything he did, he did as God. The wonder of the cross is not the death of a man who is just a mere shadow of a deity, but the death of God who had become a man. 
It was God as a man who hung there in agony as they scoffed at him. He saved others. Let him save himself if he really is the Christ of God. The soldiers mocked him, coming to him, offering him sour wine, saying, if you really are the king of the Jews, save yourself. No wonder Hebrews says, consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Consider the humiliation of the son's separation from the father. For one awful moment, while Jesus bore the sins of the entire world in his body on the tree, the father turned his face away from the son. And in that moment, an eternity of divine, harmonious, intimate relationship was shattered. The cross cost God more than anything we could ever possibly comprehend. God himself experienced the sting of separation that comes as a result of sin. They crucified the Lord of glory. The author of life tasted death. And he did all of that just to woo us and welcome us into his loving relationship. But God's humility doesn't end there. Because I find that God is still humble. You see, Jesus' earthly ministry is completed, but the incarnation is not over. The incarnation was permanent. God the Son was forever altered by the incarnation. He ever lives now in a body of glorified human flesh. He still bears in his body the marks of Calvary. When John was escorted into the throne room of heaven, he looked on the throne and he saw a lion, and then he looked again and he saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain. In heaven, he is worshipped as the Lamb of God. And even in his exaltation, the Son continues to give all glory and honor to the Father. Paul says God has exalted him to the highest place and has given him the name above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Humility is and it will forever be the hallmark of his kingly reign. And listen, do you want to know what the humble king will do one day? He will welcome us home one day. Not because of anything he did, but because of what, uh, no, of what we did, but because of what he did. And when he welcomes us home, he will move over and he'll say, Come sit on my throne with me and share a little bit of my glory. I'm going to give it to you. He is the humble king. What does the revelation of God's humility mean to me? For one thing, I find that it is a cause to adore him. Who would have ever conceived of a selfless, humble God? What other God, worshipped by any other name, anywhere else in the world, could be said to be humble? God's humility makes him something uniquely beautiful in the entire universe. No wonder the Bible says we worship him in the beauty of his holiness. Who is like unto him? Who else can compare with this great God? What does God's humility mean to me? Another thing I find is that it's a cause to trust him. The knowledge that God is humble in heart undoes all the lies that the old serpent told about him in the garden. God's humility means that he is completely trustworthy. It means that his motives towards me are completely pure and honorable. It means that he always has my ultimate good at heart. He always has my peace at heart. God's humility means that I can trust him implicitly because he would rather suffer injury himself than to leave me in an injured state. 
I can entrust myself to his beautiful leadership. There is no other beautiful king like him. There is no other beautiful shepherd like him. I can entrust myself to his care and goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I'll dwell in his house forever. You see, the knowledge that God is humble, it makes me want to run into his arms. It makes me want to be near him. It makes me want to hold on to him and never let him go. What does God's humility mean to me? Finally, I find that it is a cause to rest in him. But I would listen, this is the revelation that sent me into the stratosphere. If you'll get this, I want you to have a Christmas party in your heart today. If you get this, you'll be speaking in tongues from now until New Year's. Jesus said, when you learn that I am gentle and humble in heart, it will give rest to your soul. You see, the revelation that God is humble means the end of striving for me. Because I understand that God is not impressed by my show of strength. God is not impressed by my competence. He's not impressed by my gifts and my talents. He gave them to me anyway. He gave Pastor Nick Moore. I don't know why he did that, but that's his business. God's not impressed by my achievements. He's not impressed by my independence. He's not impressed by my success in any sphere of life. Let me tell you, whatever success you've found, it came from the Lord. God is not impressed by my efforts and holiness. He's not impressed by my good works. I'm impressed by the church in Bangladesh. Him, not so much. In fact, all the things that are valued by men are completely meaningless to God. They don't attract him one bit. Instead, the humble God is attracted by my brokenness. He's attracted by my admission of neediness. He's attracted by my cries for help. What does the incarnate Son reveal to me about the heart of the Father? What does Jesus radiate to me? What does he portray to me about the heart of our great God? Three things. Number one, that God is essentially relational. Number two, that God is infinitely humble. And finally this. The incarnation shows me that God's nature is to always finish what he starts. You're going to get happy now. Because I have a word from the Holy Spirit. It's going to take you out of 2014. It's going to take you into 15. In fact, this word is so good. It's going to take you right through 2015 and into 2016, maybe 2017. (laughs) Worship team, come help me. The incarnation shows me that God's nature is to always finish what he starts. Jesus said, my life. My food, my purpose, the thing that keeps me going is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. His final words of humiliation on the cross were, it is finished. Why did God become a man? It's because it is not in his nature to start something and not finish it. It is not in his nature to leave broken things broken. It is not in his nature to leave injured things injured. It is not in his nature to leave lost things lost. Why did God become a man? It's because it's not in his nature to leave losses unrectified. It's not in his nature to leave conflicts unresolved. He is the Prince of Peace. It's not in his nature to leave pain unrelieved. It is not in his nature to leave injustices unredressed. Why did God become a man? Because it is not in his nature to leave his promises unfulfilled. And here's a Christmas promise that you can take all the way to the bank. If you're in pain, as 2014 is ending, if you're in the middle of a conflict, if you're facing a loss, if you're lonely, 
If there are broken relationships in your life, if there's a mess in your house, if there's a mess in your finances, if there's a mess in your business, if some members of your family are lost sheep right now, Here's a promise that you can carry with you all the way home. God's very nature is to finish the good work that he started in you. I am confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. How do I know? because the incarnation of the Son tells me so. What does the incarnation show me about the heart of the Father? He is relational. He is humble. And he always finishes what he starts.